Okay, chapter 32. Uh, Job, we've been uh, saying about his three friends. Job has those three friends. And this person is a new person that's coming on the scene right here in chapter 32. His name is Elihu. In the next six, six chapters, he's going to be the one doing the speaking. He's a relative of, of Job. He's a saved relative. Like I told you before, the other three friends, I've shown you how they're lost friends. They sound religious. And a lot of things they say to Job, it's like it's from the Lord, but they're, they're using it in the wrong way and not using it at the right time. So now we have the Elihu, who, like I said, is a, is a Christian here. And another reason I say he's a Christian is because at the end of Job, I think it's chapter 42, he tells his three friends, you know, the, guard, the, the Lord calls them and tells them to repent. But he didn't call Elihu. But he did call his three friends that we've been talking about. That's another reason I say Elihu was, 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 a, was a Christian here. Now Elihu is going to try to be that mediator that Job has been asking for. Through the last chapters, Job has been saying, I need someone that can communicate between me and the Lord. You know, he's been saying that. He's, that's been his wishes. And we see that Elihu hasn't said anything. He's been there the whole time. Remember, all these chapters, there's from like chapter 6 to, to here, this is all happening in one day. All, this, all these guys are saying all this in one day. And Elihu right here, he said, I've been standing back, not saying a word. We're going to see the, the verses on that. He says, because I'm the youngest of, of the three elders there. The three men that were, I'm not even going to say they were trying to comfort Job because they did no work close to comforting Job. All they did was condemn him. They said he was wicked. But, he, but he's been standing back because he was letting the elders speak. He was the youngest, so he kept back. <clears throat> and in verse 1 of chapter 32, So these three men ceased to answer Job, because he is righteous in his own eyes. Now remember in chapter 27, verse 6, Job says, My righteousness. Job, Job is talking about his righteousness. So his friends stopped talking to him because they see that Job is trying to justify himself. Verse 2, Then was kindled the wrath of Elihu. Against Job was his wrath kindled, because he justified himself rather than God. Elihu was angry with Job, because instead of Job justifying the Lord, like saying, Hey, I don't know what I've done, but whatever, it's, whatever it is, God can't be wrong. Instead of doing that, Job went the other way, and, and he was blaming God making himself look uh, blameless. He said, Job is getting it for no cause, meaning he did no sin to, to deserve this. So Job is kind of right, but he's also kind of wrong for blaming the Lord about it, okay? Uh, and that's not kind of a wrong. Anytime you blame the Lord for something, you're wrong because the Lord is just, and we know that. If something happens to us, it's either we're out of the will of God, we're out of the will of God, or... It could be he's trying to show us something. Right here, he's using Job, even though Job hasn't done anything, but he's using Job to show the devil and the angels in heaven that Job will not curse him. In verse 3, also against his three friends was his wrath kindled. So Elihu was also mad at the three friends that had been talking to Job because they had found no answer and yet had condemned Job. So what he's saying, they accused him of being wicked and wrong, but they never, they never, they didn't wait to see, you know, why is this happening? They condemned him before they even knew what was going on. So do we need to watch out for that? We need to, like I said before, if if, if someone tells you a brother or a sister or a pastor or a teacher is doing something, don't believe it, just because this person tells you. If you need to confront that person, if you need to. And say, is this true? Okay, if the person says yes, well, then okay. But if the person says no, because remember, there's one thing the devil is a master at, at trying to make you look bad. Anybody who's born again Christian, he's a, he's a master at trying to make you look bad. Anyone who's born again, preachers, brothers and sisters, if he can make you look bad in any kind of way, he's going to jump on it. So that's why we shouldn't judge anyone until we hear it with our own ears from that person, whatever we've heard something from. If you see a brother 
pastor or whatever come out of a a beer joint. Don't right away think, man, look, he's in a beer joint. You don't know why he went in there. The Lord might have led him in there to get a brother out who's, who's, who has fallen. You don't know why he went in there. So we should not judge when we see something with these, with these eyes. We need to hear it. Oh, and when you, if you confront him and he tells you, okay, well now I know. But believe me, the devil will put everything, kind, all kind of things in your head saying he was in there. And he, so be careful when we see things, but really not know what's behind it. Verse 4. Now Elihu had waited till Job had spoken, because they were elders than, they were elder than he. When Elihu saw that there was no answer in the mouth of these three men, then his wrath was kindled. And Elihu <clears throat> and said, I'm young and you are very old. Wherefore, I was afraid and thus not show you my opinion. Elihu had wisdom right here. He respected his elders. Okay, he respected the elders and he kept his opinion. Now he said opinion. He said he kept his opinions to himself. When we're around, when we're in a room and we've got elders, someone, now I'm not talking about old people, I'm talking about people who are, who are in the age of, of knowing the Word of God, all right? Elders. If you're in a room and there's elders there, keep your opinion to yourself. That's what he did here. This is what this is showing. I'm going to use as an, as an example, but I've been studying the Word of God for 30 years now. And the Lord has given me a little understanding. Now, I get someone come, on, come up to me and, and they start telling me what they think, but they don't, ever, they don't even read this. They don't even read it, and they're telling me what they think. I don't want to hear their opinion. In fact, I have told people, not very much, but I have told people, I said, look, you're not even qualified to argue with me. I said, you, you don't even read this. You don't even read this and you're going to give me your opinion? I don't think so. Men that I know who read this and study this, now we can discuss. But men, there's people out there, they'll give you their opinion, what they think, and they've never even opened the book. So opinions, if you have opinions, I've been doing this for three years, and I think maybe three times in three years I've given you my opinion. But I also make sure that y'all know this is my opinion. 95% of, the God, 95% of the time I'm going to give you what the Word of God says, and it's not an opinion. Remember, the Scripture says... The scriptures are not up for private interpretation. These are, this is not for private interpretation. People with the Holy Spirit can understand what this says exactly. With the Holy Spirit. And they read it through the Holy Spirit. If you're reading it in the flesh, then yeah, you can get all kinds of opinions. You understand what I'm saying? Verse 7. I said, they should speak and multitudes of years should teach wisdom. But there is a spirit in man, and in the inspiration of the Almighty giveth them understanding. He's saying the elders should be wise. They should be wise. Okay, this is what he's saying right here in this verse. They should be wise, and they, and they should teach. I believe that the elders should be teaching in our church. I've, I've seen them put people in position of teaching. They're not qualified to teach. I'm talking about young, born-again Christians. The Lord says in Timothy, and one of the qualifications for being a preacher or a teacher is they can't be young. And I'm not talking about young in age. They shouldn't be a young Christian. So when we put these young people up to teach, we're going against the Scripture because I believe it's 2 Timothy chapter 3. He talks about the qualifications of being a preacher and a teacher. And one of them is they're not to be young. Verse 9, great men are not always wise, neither do the age understand judgment. He's saying here, the elders are not always wise, and they don't, they don't always give the right judgment. And that happens because, you know, none of the elders are perfect. I'm sure there's times I have might have misinterpreted something or whatever, and I don't use the excuse, well, I'm not perfect. No, I strive to be perfect because of my Lord. He wants me to complete, be complete in Him. And the best way to get complete in him is to read this. All right, This is what I do. I can't do it without this. I can say, well, as long as I follow the Ten Commandments, I can be a good Christian. No. Then you follow the law. Then you're living by the law. That's the law. This is what we live by. 
the word of God, not just the Ten Commandments. Verse 10, Therefore I said, Hearken to me, I will show my opinion. Behold, I waited for your words, I gave ear to your reasons. Will ye search out what to say? Yea, I attended unto you, and behold, there was none of you that convinced Job or that answered his words. What he's saying here is, he says, listen to what I have to say now. You know, you've had your chance. He said, now listen to what I have to say. None of y'all had the right answers for Job, is what he's saying. And in verse 13, he says, lest you should say, we have found out wisdom. God thrusts him down, not man. What he's saying is, those three men were saying, God is doing these things to you. Which that's what they were saying. God was doing it to him because he was wicked. Remember, these three friends of his, they believe Job is a wicked man. And they're saying, God has done, to the, done this to you, not man. And that's why Elihu is upset with these three guys. Now in verse 14, Now he had not directed his words against me, neither would I answer him with your speeches. Job wasn't speaking to me, and I would not have him answer him like you have. What he was saying. He's, Job didn't come to me. And Job didn't go to his three friends either. You remember, his three friends came to him. But he's saying, if Job would have came to me, I wouldn't have answered him the way y'all answered him. That's what he's saying right here. Verse 15. They were amazed. They answered no more. They left off speaking. Pretty much what that is, that is saying, they were speechless. They, they didn't say another word. Uh, verse 16. When I had waited, for that spake not, but stood still, and answered no more, I said, I will answer also my part. I also will show my opinion. For I am full of matter. The spirit within me constraineth me. Behold, my belly is as wine which is hath no vent. It is ready to burst like new bottles. I will speak that I may be refreshed. I will open my lips, lips and answer. Let me not, I pray you, accept any man's persons. Neither let me give flattering titles unto man. For I know not to give flattering titles. In so doing, my maker would soon take me away. Okay, I read all these verses. And what he's saying, he says, I'm, I'm ready to give you my opinion. And the spirit is in me. This is what Elihu was saying here. He said, I'm ready to give you my opinion. And he's saying that the spirit is in him. He's also saying that <clears throat> just because Job is well respected, Remember, Job, at the very beginning, he said he was the greatest man in the East. So he was well respected. He was wealthy, and people, the, the city respected him. Because when they were in trouble, they would come to him and he would say Job would, would lead him to the Lord. You know, lead him to get the, the strength of the Lord in him. And he would help him. So he had the title as being the, the greatest man in the East. And right here, He's saying, just because you have that title, that doesn't mean I'm going to be easy on you. That's what he's saying. Uh, Acts 10.34, it says, God is no respecter of persons. So the Lord doesn't, he doesn't look at you or what race you are. He doesn't care how wealthy you are. The only thing God looks on us, there's only one thing he sees, and that's this. This shell, he don't even see this shell. He sees this, the heart. That's all God sees. And he's not just because someone is, is richer or uh, someone more respected in, in the community. But that doesn't mean that God's going to be easier on that person. He's going to be the same on everyone. Okay, that's what he's saying here. And he says that if, if he was a respectable person, if he did do this, he said, if I did do this, God would take me on home. So preachers and teachers, make sure we don't do this. Make sure we don't do it. Don't be a respecter of a person. So uh, we shouldn't do that. You know, we should never look at the outside. We should look at the heart of men and, and, and go by that. Not by the way they dress or, or look or anything like that. And right here, Elihu says, and if I did do that, he would take me away. Meaning he would take him home. Now we go to chapter 33. Wherefore, Job, I pray thee, hear my speeches and hearken to all my words. Behold, now I have opened my mouth, my tongue hath spoken in my mouth, my words shall be of the uprightness 
of my heart, and my lips shall utter knowledge clearly. The Spirit of God hath made me, and the breath of the Almighty hath given me life. He's saying, Job, listen to me now, because I'm from the Lord. All that, what he was saying in these four verses, he's saying, listen to me, because I'm coming from the Lord. That's what Elihu was saying. In verse 5, if thou canst answer me, set thy words in order before me. Stand up. Behold, I'm according to thy wish in God's stead. I also am found formed out of clay. Now what he's saying here, I'm what you've been asking for. Remember, in those other chapters, Job's been asking for someone who can communicate him and God. He's been wanting to talk to the Lord. And he even says, if there was only a man, you know, because I can't, God, God is God, and I'm just a man, okay? So what, it, what uh, Elihu's saying right here, he says, I'm what you've been wanting. I'm that mediator. I'm the man that you've been looking for. Remember in chapter 9, verse 32 through 33, it says, For he is, this is Job, for he is not a man, as I am, talking about God, that I should answer him, and he should come together in judgment. Neither is there any daysman betwixt us, that might lay his hand upon us. So there I hear he's saying, he don't have no mediator. Someone that can talk for him to the Lord. That's what he's saying right here. And Elihu is saying, I'm your answer. You've been wanting this, here I am. So he's saying he's the mediator. First Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. There, for there is one God and one mediator between God and man. The man Christ Jesus. Now, most of us in here know that, right? There's only one mediator, and that's Jesus. So there's no one who can speak to God for us. Nobody can speak to God. You can't go to Mary. Nowhere in the Bible says, go to Mary, and Mary will, will tell me, the Lord. No saints. In fact, saints, the definition of saints in the Bible is a born-again Christian. Some religions have men or females they call them saints, so-and-so, and saints, -and so-and-so. Well, in the Bible, anybody who is a born-again Christian is a saint. In the Revelations, when he comes on his white horse, in his white robe, and he says his saints are behind him, that's us. He's calling us his saints. So that's why I'm telling you, anybody who is a born-again believer is a saint in God's eyes. There's not just certain people who can be saints. So there's a not certain people you can pray to and ask them to, to talk to God for you. Right here I'm showing you in, in Timothy. There's only one mediator. Only one. And there's nobody who can pray you out of hell either. Once you get there, you're there. There's no such thing as if you can get so many people up here praying you, praying you out of there that it can happen. No. It's false. It's not in the Bible. There's no statue. There's no statue that you can pray to that will tell God what you need. Can this guy be a mediator? He's saying he is. But remember, this is a man. He's a little different from his three friends. He is a man of God, but right here he's saying he's the mediator for him to the Lord, for Job to the Lord. A mediator, and none of us are God. None of us. So we're not mediators. So anytime someone tells you, well, I pray to so-and-so, or I pray to the statue, or I pray, show them what Timothy says. Show them right here. The Bible says there's only one mediator, and that's Christ Jesus, period. No ifs, ands, or buts. There is only one. It didn't say several. It didn't say a couple. It said there's only one. So y'all remember that. I have a question. Mm -hmm. I know you said, you know, that sometimes... You you know, when we're going through a hard time and we're like, okay, well, why is this happening? What's going on? A, a lot of times, you know, we're just, like you said, tall vision. Mm -hmm. do, do you believe that, you know, like like Elahu, he's coming to Job and saying, hey, do you believe that, well, I, I know I do, but I guess what I'm asking is, you know, God sends people our way for certain reasons to point out, you know, hey, you know, this is what God is trying to say or this is what, you know, with everything that's going on, like yeah, yeah. Elihu did. I mean, you believe that? Yeah, Elihu is, probably is doing a lot of things that the Lord wants him to do. But also, he's getting a little bit of the flesh of, of himself in there. Because we know he can't be a mediator between him and God. We know that. Right. So he's letting a little bit of the flesh get in also. Mm -hmm. 
But I'm sure a lot of what he said is from the Lord because the Lord, like I said, I, I really believe he's, he's, a, he's a Christian, all right? It's like, and I gave you the reasons why. So, but we can, sometimes we get in the flesh and not, we give the word of God, but then we throw our two cents in. I believe that's what's happening here. Uh, verse 7, Behold, my terror shall not, make, shall not make thee afraid, neither shall my hand be heavy upon thee. He's saying, since I'm a man, I'm not God. Since I'm a man, don't be afraid of me. That's what he's telling Job. Verse 8, Surely thou hast spoken in my hearing. I have heard the voice of thy words saying. He's, what he's saying here is he's heard everything that Job has said. What he's saying here, I've heard everything you've had to say. In verse 9, I am clean without transgression. I am innocent. Neither is there iniquity in me. Now this is what Elihu is saying. Elihu is making a mistake here. Because he is not perfect. This is a perfect example of why he can't be a mediator. Because already he's already messing up here. He, he's acting like he has no sin. Alright, that's what he's saying. I am clean without transgression. I am innocent. Neither is there iniquity in me. Job never said that he didn't have sin. Job never said he wasn't a sinner. Now he's made statements that sound like that when he says I'm innocent, I'm righteous. He's made statements like that. In chapter 9, verse 17, he said it. Chapter 10, verse 7. Chapter 32, verse 1. He has made statements like he's saying he's without sin, but that's not what he's saying. Because Job, in chapter 7, verse 20, Job says that he is a, he is a sinner. So when he's, he's talking about him being innocent, he's not really saying that I'm without sin. What he's saying, I'm without sin on what's happening to me. You understand? I did no sin to deserve all this, is what he's saying. And he didn't. Verse 10. Behold, he findeth occasion against me, he counteth me for his enemy. He heard Job say that God was his enemy. That Job said that. And he did. In chapter 13, verse 24, he did say that. Verse 11. He putteth my feet in the stocks. He marketh all my paths. Behold, in this thou art not just. I will answer thee that God is greater than man. He's saying, Job, you're wrong for making these kind of statements. Because the Lord is perfect, and man can't touch him. That's what he's saying here. We know the Lord is perfect, and we know we can't touch the Lord. All right. In verse 13, Why doest thou strive against him? For he giveth not account of any of his matters. So he's telling Job, why are you fighting with him? He doesn't have to give an excuse on why he's doing things to you. All right. It's, like I said, they believe this is coming from the Lord. And he's saying, God does not have to tell you why this is happening. He doesn't account to anyone. Is pretty much what he's saying, all right? Because he is just and right on everything he does. Verse 11, I mean 14. For God speaketh once, yea, twice, yet man perceiveth it not. He's saying, God shows himself to us over and over, but many times we don't see it. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. It says, Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They are unable to see the, the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glorious the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. And it's because they don't want to. The devil has blinded them. How? By giving them uh, their pleasures. Women, drugs, alcohol. Wealth. The devil's giving them all that, so they're like, why do they need the Lord? They don't need the Lord. They got all this. See what I'm saying? He's blinded them to the truth. They think they don't need the Lord. In verse 15, in a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falleth upon men, and stumbling up upon the bed, then he opens the ears of men, and seals their instructions. And in dreams and visions while we sleep, the Lord opens our ears and gives us warning of what we're doing. Now, well, there is, uh, the Lord does give dreams, and, there, and the Lord does give visions, okay? This was not just for back then. He does it today. Okay, I've, sh I've showed you through the scriptures that all the gifts are still for today. I know I belong to a church that doesn't believe that, but that's okay, that's them. But me, 
what I read from the Word of God, to me, the Lord is telling me that the, the gifts are for today. And they'll be here until the one who is perfect comes. And the one who is perfect has not come. And he says, we'll be this way until we're all united into one. There's nothing united about us. Pentecostals, you got to speak in tongues. So they don't like the Baptists. Baptists don't like them because they say you have to speak in tongues. So all these religions are like, are we together as one? No. So until this happens, and the, and the Lord says it, until this happens, when we get together as one, then we'll see them. Okay, and then the gifts will be taken. But he says right here, he, has, he appears to them in visions, in dreams. And the Lord says in Matthew 10, 39, he says that he that findeth his life shall lose it. And he that loses his life for my sake shall find it. So while the devil's giving you all this pleasure and you're enjoying yourself, he said, you got to lose all that. You have to lose that to find me. But people can't do that. And a lot of people are not going to do it. There is not going to be no great revival like some of these preachers preach. There's not going to be no great revival in the land. I'm sorry. The Bible says that the world is evil continually. And it is. It is evil continually. And what else it says? Broad is the way to hell. Broad. Meaning there's a lot of people going to hell. He said narrow is the way to heaven. Because there's very few that are going to heaven. So we can pray for revival. But within ourselves. All right, within ourselves. We can have a revival. But for this country, which is just getting further away from the Lord, we're taking everything that has anything to do with God out of whatever, schools, whatever, making sin no longer sin. Nothing wrong with homosexuality. Nothing wrong with killing babies. Do you see where we're going? And so this country getting closer to the Lord, having a great revival, it's not going to happen. Especially when the Lord said, the Lord said, that is, this world is evil continually. So it's not going to stop. 17. That he may withdraw man from his purpose and hide pride from man. He keepeth back his soul from the pit and his life from perishing by the sword. So you can change from your will to his, is what he's saying. And take away the pride that you have of not needing him. Like I said, there's people who say, I don't need the Lord. You know, I got this. I got, I got everything I want. You know, I don't need the Lord. Well, he can take all that away. The Lord is warning you. The Lord wants everybody to be saved. Everybody. There's not one person out here on this earth that the Lord doesn't wish they would get saved. The Lord wishes none of us would perish. But he says, he keepeth back his soul from the pit. What's the pit? Revelation 23. 20 verse 3. And cast him into the, talking about the devil. This is what the Lord did to the devil. And cast him into the bottomless pit. So like I said, there's different words for hell. The pit, hell, grave, Abraham's bosom, uh, paradise, prison. All this means hell, but this is all temporary. Bottomless pit, this, this, all this is temporary hell, just temporary. The hell that is forever, forever and forever, that's the lake of fire. That is your final hell. That's the final destination. But all these, the pit... The prison, all these are hell, but it's in a hell that's just temporary. And I don't know if y'all remember me teaching you that, but now we're going to find in, in uh, verses 19, 20, and 21. Right here in these three verses, it's talking about what Job is feeling right now at this time. It says in verse 19, he is chastised also with pain upon his head and the multitude of his bones with strong pain. So that his life abhorreth bread, and his soul deigneth meat. His flesh is consumed away, that he cannot be seen, and his bones that they were not seen stick out. So as we know, it put an illness on Job at the beginning of the book. He didn't take his life, but he did put an illness on him. And some people, and I believe it also, they believe that was leprosy. And right here, it's kind of a description, you know, He's so skinny, you know, and he don't want to eat. Well, this is what Job is going through right now during this time. And it throws this in here, showing you still what Job is going through. Elihu is speaking about now, verses 22 through 26, this is salvation. It's going to talk to Job like kind of a, like in parable about salvation. Okay, verse 22. 
He's going to show Job, hey, you, that's why he says, you know, it looks like he's dying. So he's telling Job, you know, it looks like you're dying. You need a Savior. So verse 22 through 26. Yea, his soul draweth near unto the grave, and his life to the destroyer. So his soul, his soul is drawn near to the grave. The wages of sin is what? Death. Death. So he's telling, he's saying, you're, because of your, you know, Eli, Elihu, he's different from the three friends, but Elihu is even, he's getting to where he's even talking like them now, okay? You can see, as you read, little by little, he starts almost saying the same thing his three friends say. But he's saying right here, you know, you're drawing near to the grave, which the wages of sin is death. And who's trying to destroy us anyway? Who wants to destroy us? He's talking about the destroyer. John 10, verse 10. The thief, the thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. That's what it says. So he's telling Job right here, you know, you're near your grave because the wages of sin is death. And then, and his life to the destroyer, meaning your life is in the hands of the devil. Because he's the one that's destroying you. Because really in John 10.10, 10, he is the destroyer. He's the one that wants to take your life. Verse 23, if there be a messenger with him, an interpreter, one among thousands, to show unto man his uprightness. He's saying we need a mediator. Now he's saying we need a mediator. We need a mediator. We need this interpreter to show us the difference between our own self-righteousness and his righteousness, which is the Holy Spirit. So he's showing them that you need. He's showing them that he's he's dying and going to hell, which we know. Until you get born again, that's where we're at. Until you get born again, the the, the Bible says we're dead. That's why he says, "I give you life." And plus, he says you're dead. So he's trying to show them that okay, you're dying, and you need an interpreter, a mediator. And then in verse twenty four, then he, then he is gracious unto him and saith, "Deliver him from going up to the pit." And I have found a ransom. Who's going to keep us from going to hell? Who was our ransom? Jesus. So he's showing Jesus here. We have a ransom. He can keep you from going to the pit. Matthew's verse, uh, Matthew's twenty, verse twenty-eight. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and to give his life a ransom for many. So right here we know that Jesus is our ransom. Then in verse twenty-five, his flesh shall be. Fresher than a child's, he shall return to the days of his youth. Now, what does that sound like? It sounds like being born again. All right, that's what I'm saying. Right here, he's given he's he's given the salvation plan. You're dying. You're going to hell. You need a mediator. This mediator, the one who's paid our ransom, that's who's going to be our 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 mediator, our interpreter. What it says here, and you you need to be born again. Like Second Corinthians five seventeen. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. How many people give their lives? Say they give their life to the Lord, but you see no change in them. Oh, I gave my life to the Lord, but you see no change. The Lord said, if you get born again, you become a new creature. If you can't see the new creature in this person, are they born again? Because He says old things are passed away. So the things you've been doing, that's passed away. He said, behold, new things. New things are going to come your way. Just like with me. I mean, there was, it was like night and day. Because I, I drank, I was drunk all the time, okay? And I did this and I did that and stayed in bars. But when I gave my life to the Lord, definitely, without a doubt, people could say, that's a new creature. That's, who is this guy? We give him what? We give him our all. All our soul, spirit, and mind. You give him all your soul, spirit, and mind. You can't help but become a new creature. Because before you had, before you gave him your all, all you had was wickedness in your heart. And I've taught you on that. The Lord says it. Anyone who's not born again has a wicked heart. So he's got to get born again. Then verse 26. We shall pray unto God, and he will be favorable unto him, and he shall see him face with joy, for he will render unto man his righteousness. <clears throat> we see here that the... That a man has to pray to God. That he has to repent and depend on God's righteousness instead of his own righteousness. How many, I mean, there's a lot of people who have their own righteousness. Well, I'm going to heaven because 
my good outweighs my bad. Well, that's their righteousness. That's what they think is right. Well, I'm going to heaven, like I said a while ago. I'm going to heaven because I obey the Ten Commandments. I mean, people need to read the Bible. They need to read the Bible. Too many people, too many, way too many people depend on a man like me, a preacher, to tell them what's what. Instead of them reading it for themselves. Just like the Jehovah Witness, they cannot question the, the elders, the leaders of that religion. They cannot question them. Because they'll be wrong. They'll be wrong if they question anything to a leader. And there's other churches like that. You cannot question what the man is saying. Well, the Bible says it's better to put your trust in the Lord than in man. That's why I tell y'all, when I'm teaching, don't put all your trust in me. You go home, read the scriptures for yourself, and make sure I didn't take them out of context. Read them for yourself. And know that you know that, I, that you know, yes, that was from the Lord. Not from Jesse, but from the Lord. Do not put your confidence in a man. A man will, he will disappoint you. Well, not, well there's, yeah, there's men that will deceive you. They're called wolves. And there's many out there. But just like I tell my wife, don't depend on me to give you happiness. You want happiness? Look to the Lord. If I want happiness, I don't look to my wife, even though she does make me happy. But I don't look for my happiness to come from her. I look to the Lord for my happiness. And when that happens, everything else is... Now, when, she's, when she makes me happy, that's just bonus. That's just bonus time. But a Christian, a born-again Christian, his happiness should come directly from the Lord. If he's dependent on anybody or anything, money, material stuff, anything like that, he's going to be let down. Because all that is just temporary. The Lord, happiness is forever. Remember that. Now, the next two verses are speaking about either, it's either talking about backsliders or it's talking about lost people. We talked about how to get uh, saved, that we need a Savior. Now he's going to talk about people who... This could attain to lost people or can attain to, to backsliders. But in verse 27, He looketh upon men, and if any say, I have sinned, and perverted that which was right, and profited me not, he will deliver his soul from going into the pit, and his life shall see light. What he's saying, if any man says, I'm a sinner, and I've gone astray from the righteousness of God. Well, Matthew 16, 26 says, For what is a man profited? If he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul. Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? From these verses, this, like I said, this, this can apply to a lost person or it can apply to a backslider. A backslider is doing the same thing a lost person is doing. But if he's a backslider, he's got the Holy Spirit, but he's in the flesh. And he will come back. It's kind of like the prodigal son. Y'all know about the prodigal son? Okay. He left his father to go into the world. He wanted to do his thing. Now, once he got out there, he was not comfortable. Okay, he wasn't comfortable with the, with the world. He had to, uh, I think, live with the pigs or something like that. But anyway, he said, I have sinned. He said, I have sinned. So he knew what he was doing. He knew this was sin. Where lost people don't look at it that way. Lost people won't say, I have sinned. So a backslider, he'll go into the world... And if you're a backslider and, you, and, and you're born again, you, you can't stay in the world very long. You can't. You, you'll, you'll have to come back to your father. Now, now, if you go back into the world and you stay there and you don't come back, then you wasn't really ever really born again. And I have, I have, I have taught on that, the difference between the two. You got the prodigal son who returned, and you're going to return. But then you got lost people out there who... You know, they don't look at that as being sin. Sex before marriage, what's wrong with that? That's the way you look at it. Being gay, you know, what's wrong with that? They accept this stuff, so they're not going to say, well, I'm a sinner. A backslider who knew God, who knows God, and goes into the world, that's why I say the prodigal son, the prodigal son said, I have sinned. So he knew the difference, and he came back to the Father. So there's a difference there. I mean, they're both into the world, but the born-again Christian, the backslider, will return. Verse 29, verse 29, Lo, all these things worketh God oft, often with, with man. 
God is always, you know, He's always, He's, He's, like I said, the instructions of the Lord, they're always with us. In a dream, in a vision, you know, in just teaching, He's always showing Himself to man, always. You think, you say to yourself, well, people in the middle of Africa, out in the jungle, how are they going to know about the Lord? I don't know. I don't know. But I know in John, it says, Jesus said, I have enlightened the man, I have enlightened the heart of every man. If the Lord says, I have enlightened the heart of every man, what he's saying is, I have shown everybody, everybody, who I am. There is no man going to be able to go before the Lord on judgment day and say, I didn't know you. Because he said it right there in John. I have enlightened the heart of every. He didn't say some. He didn't say most. He said every. So how he gets that person out in the jungle, in the middle of nowhere, I don't know. But he does. And that's what he does here. He's always, he's, he's reaching us. He's always reaching out for us. Verse 30, to bring back his soul from the pit to be enlightened with the light of the living. He was dead, and now he's alive in Christ. Of course, this is the resurrection. So, so he had his resurrection body. And this is what he's talking about here, up here, about the resurrection body. And he says, 31, Mark well, O Job, hearken unto me, hold thy peace, and I will speak. If thou hast anything to say, answer me. Speak, for I desire to justify thee. Elihu was saying, if you have anything to say, say it now. Because I want to see if you're right. He's saying, he's, he's telling Job, I've been saying all this, I've heard all this, if you have anything to say, say it now. If you believe you're right, then say it now. And then verse 33, if not, hearken unto me, hold thy peace, and I shall teach thee wisdom. So he's saying, if you don't have anything to say, then listen to me, is what Elihu is saying. Now remember, Elihu is, <laughs> it's kind of hard to explain, but like I said, Several things he is saying is from the Lord, but then, like I said, he throws his two cents in also. So we got to know, and the, the way we know when he's doing that is by us knowing what this says. <coughs> Any man that says anything, you'll know if he's a man of God. Prophets. Uh, there's gift of prophecy. They have men out there who, who are prophets. Now, I wouldn't want to be a prophet because back then... If you made a mistake on anything you prophesied, you were stoned to death. They need to do that today. If they were to do that today, we wouldn't have so many men out there saying, I'm a prophet. You hear me? And the ones that are not in the will of God, the ones that are, that are doing it like, I'm a prophet. They're just boasting on themselves. But if we were to do today what they did back then, as soon as a prophet prophesied something and it didn't come to pass, he was stoned. He was killed. So I wish we could follow God's rules today like they did back then. We wouldn't have so many men out there boasting about themselves on who they are.